kind of quasi-public situation. We open up um, the first part of our lecture series to people from the broader community, the broader university, um, uh, which we like doing. Um, it's always quite productive to have our students intermingling with people from outside the university and also from other parts of uh, uh, USC. So um, I'm going to read um, a prepared bio, uh, which is uh, quite eloquent and um, uh, I think authored by Alan, and uh, he is the best spokesperson for his practice, so I will um, proceed with this information. Um, Alan is an American photographer, writer, critic, and filmmaker, born in Erie, Pennsylvania in 1951, and he lives and works in Los Angeles. Since the early 1970s, Alan's work has bridged the gap between conceptual art and documentary practices, focusing on economic and social themes ranging from family life, work, and unemployment, to schooling and the military industrial complex. While calling many of the conventions of documentary into question, he continues to see photography as a social practice answerable to the world and its problems. While early themes reappear with some regularity in more recent work, since the mid-1980s, he has taken on the geoeconomics of globalized production and distribution of goods by way of the sea. He argues in his book, An Exhibition Project Fish Story, from 1989 through 1995, those are the dates of that particular project, that the sea is the, quote, forgotten space, end quote, of modernity. The cargo container is a, quote, coffin of remote labor power of labor performed elsewhere, close quote, and a har harbinger, harbinger of doom for a productivist economic system that can imagine nothing but endless growth. This story was deliberately exhibited in port cities, in Rotterdam, Stockholm, Glasgow, and Calais, followed by Los Angeles and Seattle. In Seattle in early 1999, the work was closely tied to a growing popular resistance to neoliberal globalization and culminated in the dramatic anti-WTO protests at the end of that year. The most recent exhibition of, the complete, of that complete work was in Document 11 in Kassel, Germany in 2002, and was accompanied by the publication of a German edition of the book entitled Siemens Garn, Ship of Fools, and the accompanying Dockers Museum, 2010, is an attempt to reframe the local embeddedness and global thematics of Sekula's continuing maritime investigations and aesthetic experiments. Allen's other books include Photography Against the Grain, published in 1984, Geography Lesson, Canadian Notes, published in 1996, Titanic's Weight, 2003, Performance Under Working Conditions, also 2003, and Polonia and other fables from 2009. His collected writings on the history and theory of photography have been translated into Polish, English, French, and Japanese. English, French, and Japanese editions are currently in preparation. His films include, I'm, I'm going to flub these uh, pronunciations, but I apologize <coughs> in advance, uh, Tsukiji from 2001, Gala from 2005, a short film for Laos, 2006, Lottery of the Sea, 2006 as well, and co-directed with Noah Birch, The Forgotten Space from 2010, which is based on Fish Story and premiered at the 2010 Venice Film Festival, winning the Orizonte Special Jury Prize. So it's our great pleasure to welcome Alan Sikula to our critical conversations today. Thank you for being here, Alan. That's a sort of bio one prepares when you're nominated for one of these art prizes, but I have to tell you, I, for that particular art prize, I didn't, don't think I even made it to the short list, so don't take it as an example of anything useful. Um, all right, I, um, maybe we can take the room lights out and... Uh, is that? I'm just going to... Going to um, go through these for a second here. Can you hear me, everyone?
So this, these are two projects uh, dating from this past year, uh, Ship of Fools and Dockers Museum. Um, and the, uh, began with an invitation from the Museum of Contemporary Art in Antwerp uh, to make an exhibition. And I went back to a group, a group of pictures I'd made in 1999-2000 um, accompanying the voyage of a, uh, a converted cargo ship that was making a global exhibition about working conditions at sea. The ship was sponsored by the International Transport, Transport Workers Federation, which is a kind of NGO trade union umbrella group um, that represents about 450 unions of transport workers around the world. Uh, the ITF was founded in the last decade of the 19th century when um, Dutch dock workers struck in support of British seafarers. So it was one of the first modern instances of international labor solidarity. And from that time on, the ITF was affiliated with closely with unions that were connected to the uh, socialist international, to the second international. In fact, during the Cold War, the ITF was uh, <coughs> frequently opposed to uh, communist trade unions. Uh, and clo closer, of course, to the European socialist parties and left-leaning socialist parties in the rest of the world. So there are unions uh, loosely affiliated with the ITF, ranging from cab drivers in Durban, South Africa, to uh, Mexican flight attendants, airline flight attendants and pilots, to uh, dock workers in most countries, fishermen, uh, workers of the sea, workers of air transport, land transport, truck drivers, and the like. And the ITF has tried to set standards for, um, for working conditions and safety in all of these fields and uh, has, in fact, been involved in the last few years in uh, taking up the issue of security from uh, the perspective of the people who do the work of transport, um, um, offering, I would say, an often rather somewhat dissonant voice to the sort of global security machine. Um, the, um, what the ITF, one of the main campaigns of the ITF has been to try to temper or, or combat or reform the flag of convenience shipping system that emerged largely through the work of American lawyers in the period uh, just after the Second World War and it became the standard for global shipping whereby ships owned in the rich countries are registered in the poor countries and uh, this allows the beneficial owner, the so-called beneficial owner of uh, uh, maritime shipping capacity to um, benefit from paying lower wages. Um, shipping was one of the first industries to be truly globalized in terms of its labor force. Um, the Second World War ended with actually very powerful trade unions in the developed world because of the role played by seafarers in the convoy war in the Atlantic, for example. And uh, it was the ambition, of course, of capital to break these unions, um, partly through in the United States through red baiting and uh, anti-communist clauses in the Taft-Hartley Act and the like, and then through the flagging out of ships so that they could hire foreign crews. So the um, majority of seafarers in the world today uh, come from either Asian countries with Filipino in the, first, Fili the Philippines in the first place, uh, and with the former Soviet bloc countries in second place. I think Russians are the second group and Chinese form the third group. The Chinese are somewhat exceptional in the sense that the Chinese uh, flags its ships t to China, so they still have a national registry, but their wages paid on Chinese ships tend to be the lowest in the world. Interestingly, of the 98, no, I think it was 83 cities visited by the Global Mariner, the one uh, Chinese port they were able to put into, Hong Kong did not allow them to tie up uh, to a dock and they, so visitors to the ship had to uh, come out in water taxis and chartered boats which of course limited the public access to the ship. And what the ship would do was to, uh, it basically made a circumnavigation 
starting in 1998 and over 20 months, made this voyage around the world and, and uh, with, with the idea of uh, uh, showing an exhibition that criticized the, the, this flight convenience system. And the aim is to establish minimum standard wages for seafarers uh, to extract at least some compensation from the shipping companies to provide for a fund for seafarers' uh, uh, health care, uh, for their repatriation in cases of family crisis and the like, um, and, uh, and to really at least temper the, the brutality and, and rather primitive brutality of the system. Um, the, uh, it's, it hasn't been an entirely successful effort, um, uh, but at the same time, the the ITF continues this fight. And what interested me when I first encountered the ship, I actually met the ship for the first time in my hometown, San Pedro, uh, when it visited and I fell into conversation with the, the uh, seafarers <coughs> and crew officers of the ship. All of whom were volunteers. Uh, it was a very multinational crew. Uh, a number of seafarers had been blacklisted for union organizing, so they couldn't get regular seafaring jobs. Uh, the ship was flagged to the refitted, it was flagged the British flag, so it was paying British seafarer wages, which are much higher. Uh, for example, it was a Burmese seafarer aboard the ship who would have been probably killed by the slork had he returned to, to, uh, to Burma. Um, there were Filipinos who had been blacklisted, there were Russians, um, there were media activists, most of them German, a few of them English. Some of the uh, members of the crew were former Greenpeace activists, so it was a kind of green green-red alliance, you might say, of left-wing trade unionists and uh, people who'd sort of broken with Greenpeace over the failure of Greenpeace to address issues of social class and labor conditions in, 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 uh, in the context of environmental struggles. Um, I, made, I used pictures from this ship's voyage in a number of works, uh, Titanic's Wake, uh, a work that I also that I showed it, uh, uh, in Documenta. 12, uh, which was uh, called uh, Shipwreck and Workers, but I never really returned to the pictures in any, any uh, comprehensive way. And I decided to go back and, and, and focus 10 years after this voyage on the ship and what it had done. And in, in light of thinking 10 years into, into the uh, uh, war on terror, uh, what, what, what has happened to this kind of anti-globalization movement in this particular branch of it. So, uh, I, the one group of pictures is called uh, uh, The Crew, The Pilot, and The Russian Girlfriend, and that's these first ten. So you have the German and um, British, Irish uh, crew members here, uh, a Dutch cook, Japanese uh, engine room cadet, Croatian engineer. German media technician, um, British bosun, a Swiss a deck officer cadet studying in an Italian maritime academy. Switzerland doesn't have a merchant marine. Um, the Croatian pilot, uh, a Russian deck. Deckhand, who actually is a physician in his, in his former life, but he made more money working as a seafarer. Very typical, of, you know, people from the professions in the Soviet Union would go to sea, sometimes working with small traders on the side, you know, buying things and selling them at home in order to survive. Uh, and here's the uh, chief mate and his Russian girlfriend. group of students in South Africa greeting the ship. I, I followed the ship between Portland, uh, between San Francisco and Portland. I met them again in Seattle, where I was showing my Project Fish story, and people from the crew came to see that exhibition. Both the ship and my exhibition, as the, the bio suggested, were part of a whole panoply of events that were happening in Seattle over 1999 that were sort of laying out the question of how the working class might resist the neoliberal globalizing paradigm the sort of paradigm that institutions like the USC are deeply committed to as part of the 
global mode of domination. Um, here the ship is in Belarusisk and the Black Sea coast of Russia. People would visit in, in Karachi. I wasn't on the ship in Karachi, but something like 300,000 people showed up over the, over the four days the ship was there. There were so many people on the ship that it almost capsized at the dock. Mm -hmm. It's strange in third world ports you find that, that they're often very police controlled zones, custom zones, you know, obviously with governments that are typically authoritarian. So people who live in the port districts often don't get to see what something is, you might say as simple as a ship and old fashioned as a ship. I mean, this introduces them to a world of technology that is in a way beyond them. And in fact, one of the issues with the ship was, was how to provide, the possibility of providing better training, for example, for the Maritime Academy in South Africa. And there were lessons um, the conducted while the ship was in port in, in ship handling and things like that. At that point, the South Africans didn't have their own training vessels. So one idea was perhaps the ship could have been retired after its voyage as a, as a kind of a training ship uh, moved between different countries, but that didn't work out. And in fact, the ship was put back in service under the British flag. The, the, the ITF didn't want the ship to, be, didn't want to sell the ship so that it could be used for further exploitation. So they kept it under the British flag. And we're managing, it did a bare boat charter, which means that the uh, charters of the ship were responsible for booking voyages and cargo and so on. Um, and the ship uh, had, was hit by another ship in the Orinoco River in Venezuela sank, so that was the end of the Global Mariner. Um, I was sent an email with a picture of the ship sinking, and I thought it was a joke because it came with no text. And it was, and it's a very funny thing to see an image of the ship, you know, rather well wow, going down. So, so yeah, I was on the ship in South Africa um, between Durban and Cape Town. Uh, I wish I'd stayed on to Lagos, but I had a book, a book signing to do here in Los Angeles, and so jumped on the plane in Cape Town and came home and seven people showed up for the book signing, so I felt, I felt sort of like I wish I'd gone to Lagos. Um, and uh, then I joined the ship again in Cyprus about four days after the events in Seattle in 99 and sailed with them to Novorossiysk, to Constanza, Romania, to uh, Istanbul, and then around to Coburg in Slovenia. This little group of pictures, there are three here. Uh, it's called the, uh, um, the Drunken Pilot, near collision. The pilot, it was, it was uh, January 1st, 2000, the first day of the new millennium, if we follow the calendar in that way. And uh, as I photographed the pilot coming aboard, off, off of the Copair, um, you have to imagine a kind of blast of slip of its breath. And um, I proceeded to go to the bow to watch them sort of do the mooring. And um, it turned out that he, the, the, the pilot on the bridge gave a half, half a head order when he should have given a half a stern order. And so um, we almost collided with this Turkish freighter called the Katka Mepper, very nice name. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can see the rather worried, you can't tell from the photo, but rather worried Turkish crew. But we, you can see here that the ship is reversed and all that. Seven churned up from the harbor bottom to avoid the collision. And this is a moment when, just before everyone, the first mate yells, so hold on to something, because even at slow speed, uh, the momentum of such a collision throw you at the distance. I remember looking back, my, my wife had joined. I said, oh, well, can I bring my wife along because it's the new year of the millennium? And they said, sure. I mean, nobody was terribly sober in the course of these days coming up to the Adriatic. And uh, I remember looking back and Sally was standing on the front hatch cover with nothing to hold on to. And I thought, oh my God, she's going to get furrowed. You know, that instantaneous feeling that something's going to happen. But luckily, they the captain apparently pushed the, 
the drunken Slovenia, a pilot aside, and uh, yelled out, pull, pull, a stern, uh, pull a stern order, and now got us out of the range of collision by about, by, by about two feet. Um, and of course, this was the kind of thing that the shipping companies would have loved to have this ship toward the end of its certain navigation demonstrate its incompetence. Um, I thought that was worth telling as a little story. Um, this is called The Good Ship, which is everything with the global narrative strategy. This is The Bad Ship, um, meaning, by which I simply mean an old ship that is necessarily going to have problems. I mean, you know, these are the kind of ferries that you know, run between Egyptian ports and ports in Saudi Arabia, say, and can sink, and as has happened with thousands of people aboard insufficient life-saving equipment and the like. Um, in, in ports like Cyprus and the Eastern Mediterranean, in, in, uh, like Limassol and the Eastern Mediterranean, you see a lot of ships like this. Older ships that have been owned, you know, gone through 20, 30 changes in ownership. This is called Eyes in the Engine Room. It's <coughs> And this photograph is not actually from the voyage of this ship, which probably anyone who knows ships could tell because the engine, the, the wake you're seeing here is just too powerful. This is actually a modern uh, 8500 TEU container ship churning up the uh, Indian Ocean on the westbound course. It, it's a photo made in, in conjunction with the, the film I just finished. It's called churn. And so one of the things I decided to do in Antwerp was to begin to um, introduce objects into the work. Um, I tended to have this idea that photography is always stuck in a kind of two-dimensional triangular space with literature, uh, painting, and, and cinema at, at the apexes of the triangle and photography sort of moving. You know, having no real identity of its own, affiliated um, by a kind of gravitational force to one of the apexes or the other. And what's interested me is to try out all the possibilities and also to resist the, the, the most powerful gravitational pull, which is the pull of painting. I mean, that's been the institutional. Not that paintings as images uh, aren't important, and, um, but I think we, if we redefine the pull of painting as that of the Graphic, static graphic arts include printmaking and things like that, then the gravitational force seems a bit more welcoming and less about pre uh, aesthetic prestige. Um, so as I was thinking about showing in Antwerp, of course, it's very hard to think about doing a show in Belgium without, and I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, I like the specificity of Belgian art. Um, I think one could teach, in fact, I tried once to, teach a semiotics course using only examples from Netherlandish Belgian art, you know, starting with, you know, the Tower of Babel and Bruegel and going on from there to, to uh, people like Ensor and uh, uh, Meunier, the sort of late 19th century figures onward to Magritte, to Grotaires artists like Jeff Geis, you know, that in some ways the history of modernism and of classical art can be summed up on a very Flemish uh, or Belgian trajectory. Uh, and um, so it's hard not to think about Brotaires. And it occurred to me that my triangle needed to be revised. I, I, there's a little text of Brotaire's about cinema where he talks about the relationship between uh, the word, the object, and the image. And I thought, well, I don't really have the object in my system. So what happens when you, when you think about sculpture or architecture? And do, does this triangle then become a three-dimensional, you know, triangular uh, pyramid of sorts? Um, and, but my idea was not to follow the model of of the structure of the exhibiting institution, as I think Brotaire's did with much of his work on 
museum-like um, configurations, but rather to, to take up a kind of thematic pressure from below, like what objects would come to, up to the surface. Um, and so I, I started to find things like uh, transmazoreal prints, um, these, these sort of signs, uh, late 19th century uh, uh, illustrated press graphics. This is a British press lamenting the uh, Belgian brutality of the dogs. This is a World's Fair from the 30s in, in Antwerp with the, the Hansa building, weirdly enough, no longer exists. And this is an, um, actually the oldest print I was able to find, which is a, um, probably early 18th century, late 17th century print of the original Hansa building in Antwerp. You know, the Hansa being the trading consortium that included, you know, that stretched from the North Sea coast up into the Baltic to Gdansk. And uh, down to Antwerp, and was part of a major part of 13th, 14th, and 15th century uh, sea trade in Europe. Um, and then I, I had the, a selection of the flags of convenience, ranging from the Marshall Islands to Panama, Liberia, Cyprus, uh, and so on. And, and then this uh, this rather elongated ship model. And these kind of, you know, this is all sort of eBay. You know. the, the, the persistence of this image of the dock worker, which comes in part from Meunier, and I've done earlier work for the project I did for, for Documenta 12 about Meunier's sculpture, this great you know, Belgian social realist. Um, and I was interested in the persistence of this Meunier image. Now, the invitation came from Antwerp at roughly the same time I was invited to participate in the Sao Paulo Biennale. And so I had the idea already in Antwerp that I would make a link to Santos, which is the main uh, biggest port in, in South America. And then um, imagine this, you know, these two port cities in, in alignment somehow. So um, the trick in the, in the objects, but so this, this stereo card is, the, I think, loading bananas in Santos. And then there are two Antwerp um, city emblems on Belgian military patches, and then a couple of British Royal Dalton style kitsch docker heads. Um, and then there's a reproduction of the Meunier docker, which is, exists as a, as a sculpture in, in, uh, in Antwerp. And I just discovered in, in, in uh, Calau, in Peru as well, there's a Meunier docker presiding at the port. And then a seal who looks rather similar from the uh, Antwerp Zoo. This hood that dockers would wear to, to protect themselves when they're carrying things like partially tanned hides or um, bananas, you know, to keep the tarantulas from crawling into their hair. And then I came up with this rather pathetic, uh, um, you know, I, I don't want to call it an assisted ready-made. I, I don't think any of these. These are objects of interest, as, as I see. Uh, this is a Portuguese drinking cup of the effigy of a docker, and I, I simply found someone selling raw, unroasted Santos coffee and rebagged it in burlap sacks. Um, and then these are the pictures I made after the show in Antwerp in Santos, because by that time I, could, I, I was able to convince the, my sponsors in Brazil to allow me to come down and spend, spend some time. So this one's called Not Working. This is working. This is actually loading sugar, not coffee, for China. A whole ship full of sugar. Very decrepit ship. Terrifying ship. Um, and this is waiting for work. This is the doctor's dis dispatch in Santos. So everybody shows up to get, to get their ship. And, working. and if they're lucky, they don't work in the sugar hole. And then this, this is a, ga a gang working. Motion sequence. The ship is under Chinese flag or Brazilian flag? No, this was Chinese flag ship. Yeah, at that moment when I was there, which was this past July, the, the, 
Brazil's sugar exports have gone to a level unprecedented since something like 75. Huge raw material exports, and China is a big customer for that. And coincidentally, the, the, the harbor was being dredged continually by these Belgian dredges, because the Belgians specialize in dredging operations, and dredge Dubai, and they, they tend to own the, the dredgers tend to be built in Spain and in Bilbao, owned by Belgians, and they work globally, depending on where major dredging operations are. And then this is just a photo in a little waterfront cafe in San Jose. I, it, it's a cleaning lady having her, having her lunch in this lanche place, and I just like the idea of her working out and having a brother or a son or a husband who's working, or working herself on a, on a weekend cleaning one of these office buildings devoted for the shipping industry. And this is the Dockers Monument in Santos. So the two, the, the emblematic image of Santos is, is Pele, you know, it's football, or this Docker figure manhandling, you know, a 30 kilo bag of coffee. And they even, you know, they even would have contests with people holding five of them on their shoulders. So you can imagine the spinal compression from that. And then here's the installation in Brazil where I, I was lucky enough to be able to, well, I was design the space myself. So, I'm not sure the photos have an idea, but it had a certain interior, you know, kind of spiraled inward into this kind of port-like space. Uh, so that's that. And, and also, you, like here, this is from a musical called The, um, the Thrill of Brazil. So I was really happy to find these dancing dock workers with their bags of cocktails. <laughs> Supposed to be Durer painting the Port of Angelo, sketching the Port of Angelo. And then I also had projections, one of which was a, uh, I was able to find an old uh, special effects projector made for a planetarium, and, you know, they would project the nebula. Um, and I substituted a circular uh, tongue of, of the churn image, and it rotates at about one RPM, so basically playing with the idea of the ship's screw turning. So it's, it's, it's sort of cinematic, but not. Uh, okay, I'm going to stop there. This is from the earlier work that I did for Documenta. Um, time. I'd like to show you an excerpt from uh, the film I just completed, uh, working with my old friend, Mel Birch. It's a film based on my project, Fish Story. Um, the, uh, it's double click and it becomes a big thing. Yeah. Um, this, this film, and, and where it's relevant to the question of public art, I mean, I decided not to show you outdoor pieces in this talk and to show these more recent things, but I have been doing since um, about 2005 works that have been shown outdoors, and in that sense are technically more public. But one thing I would say about, for example, the Sao Paulo Biennale is that it, there's an enormous attendance of school children. I mean, thousands and thousands of people go through the exhibition. So th that's an example of, 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 of the cultural policy of the Brazilians to make the work very, very accessible and to work out a pedagogic program and so on. Um, the reason I say this now is because the, the genesis of this film actually came from a public art foundation in Holland called SCORE, the, the uh, Society for Art in Public Space. Um, and uh, they're based in Amsterdam. And they respond, they do not initiate projects. They only respond to invitations from municipalities, uh, regions, you know, let's say like the Helderland decides they want something, or a little dork in the middle of Holland, or, or a, a, a maybe a, a home for old people, or um, an asylum. Any number of institutions can put forward proposals, and what had happened was that there had been a big fight in Holland about <coughs> building a uh, dedicated uh, container freight line from the port of Rotterdam to the German border. 
And this cut across, the idea was to bring this uh, cargo um, more or less outside the cities um, and, and um, uh, run it to Germany where presumably it would hook into an integrated German rail network. So it's part of the battle of any contemporary port is to control uh, access to its hinterland and to seek advantage over rival ports. In the case of Rotterdam, that means Hamburg and um, Antwerp. And despite the fact that Europe is unified, you know, mm -hmm. um, they all fight with each other over access to the market. So interestingly enough, on the German side of the line, no work was done because they weren't particularly interested in helping Rotterdam uh, increase its cargo capacity. They wanted to favor Hamburg. <coughs> So despite European integration, there's all this city-state-like behavior that probably is even more primitive in a way than the integration that existed at the time of the Hansa, you know? um, which is one of the weird puzzles about you know, globalization. You know, we see local interests, and, and you see it in China with the ports competing and so on. Um, in any event, the townspeople didn't like the freight line, not because they thought it was going to be a boondoggle, though they suspected that, but because it was it caused environmental damage, they couldn't see why the freight couldn't go on barges, and there's an extensive river network, um, which is not used to capacity. So um, they fought it quite ferociously, but lost in the end, and they wanted their, at least their struggle to be commemorated. And someone from this foundation said, well, here, take a look at this book by this guy, this American guy, and they looked at it, and they said, that's the guy we want to work with. So I was approached, and they said, do you want to make a work of public art? And I said, well, I don't particularly like the idea of public art, it seems you know, a kind of standard answer about big things and closets. But I said, but you know, uh, would it be, wouldn't it be interesting to, to uh, think about a film that could be shown on television as a work of public art? Would, they, would the village accept that? I went to meet the people in the village, we discussed it, they showed me around, they showed me how the rail line was coming in. At this time, it was still being constructed. And, um, and then I spoke to my, my friend Noel Birch, who had translated the text of his story into French, and uh, had said to me at the time, this could be a film. And I said, Noel, do you want to work on a film? So we got initial funding from this foundation, SCORE, in Amsterdam. And then <coughs> this was in 2000, and Noel and I kind of more or less on our own dime went to do some research, we went to Hong Kong. Uh, we had a French producer who was interested, uh, and, but it took, essentially seven years to get the funding. And by that time, we switched to a Dutch and Austrian production company. And, um, and the film came out this last September. It premiered in Venice. Uh, it's shown in I, uh, something like 20 festivals in Europe so far. Um, it, um, it'll have its first screening in the Americas in Argentina. We just learned yesterday we were accepted to hot dogs in Toronto. Um, we were turned down by uh, Sundance. Um, I'm not even sure it will be shown uh, where, where, where our US premiere will be. We got a very nasty review in Variety, saying we're a couple of old Marxists. <laughs> simplistic <laughs> ideas. And that the film, the title of the film is The Forgotten Space, and the film is best forgotten. And the writer was particularly incensed by what we say about, the Bil about Bilbao. But the structure of the film um, is, is uh, more or less to go from, from Holland to, uh, to Asia, to Los Angeles, and then to Asia, and then come back to Europe. And it's punctuated with uh, passages aboard a container ship. You don't know where the container ship is going. It's coming from Asia to Europe. And I'm going to show you the Los Angeles segment of the film. Uh, it's about 20 minutes. Are we okay with that in terms of time? Uh, yeah, that, that would bring us to about uh, 10 or so after one, and then if you want to have some then discussion. Then we have a discussion, yeah. yeah. So let me let me start here. Um, I think the Los Angeles segment, it makes sense to show here, and there's also an appearance by the uh, U USC marching band, so. <laughs>
between 1950 and 2010, global shipping tonnage has increased at a rate nearly three times that of world population growth. More and more stuff travels the high seas. The crew knows nothing of the cargo, but for refrigerated goods, which must be checked daily. Frozen cod returns to the familiar waters of the North Atlantic after a detour to China for low-wage billeting. Second-hand container cranes pass on the horizon, destined to unload American military cargo in the Middle East. The first engineer compares the ship to a powerful and voracious bear, guzzling 5,000 gallons of bunker fuel per day. Bunker oil is sulfurous, Car-like in its viscosity, the cheapest and dirtiest available, the very dregs of the refinery, leaving a smoky yellow smear on the horizon and turning the ocean a city. against rust, washing, chicken, pain, washing, chicken, pain. California has two great natural harbors, the shelter bays of San Francisco and San Diego. Los Angeles was a windswept and barren outpost with a trade in leather from the Spanish ranchos of the coastal plain. It was said in those days that California shocked the world. More of an anchorage than a port, Los Angeles was despised by seafarers for its remoteness. And yet it was Los Angeles and the adjoining port of Long Beach that became the biggest port complex in the Americas. Now, 40% of the cargo entering the United States passes through these harbors. In its distance from the city center, this was the model for what the Port of Rotterdam became, for what most ports became in the age of containers. Many Angelinos, accustomed to taking the beach for granted, are unaware that the city even has a port, even though it appears anonymously in countless Hollywood films. In the maritime world, people are often amused by the American obsession with counter-terrorist security. Only 2% of containers are inspected. More than that, and the system would grind to a halt. In congressional hearings, politicians worry about the container as a Trojan horse, or perhaps a Pandora's box. history of the California working class. Fishermen, dock workers, cannery hands, migrants all. More recent graves of young men who fall out of a shrinking working class and into a world of guns and gangs. Graves tended by Samoans from across the Pacific.
first film, Joseph von Sternberg, shot on Terminal Island, across from San Pedro. The best of the countless films made here, because it took the making of the port seriously, and not as something given mere salty atmosphere for dramatic deeds. An unusual and prescient film for the boom years of the 1920s. Poor people decide to fight their oppressors. People they love to drive, and they think they don't know how to drive. Especially the drivers that go work locally, and they never work out of place. If, if they never like, to, if they don't like to drive, they're not gonna like it. Driving is something that is, I think it's coming to itself already. It's, it's a, you know, something that you want to really do. Something that you enjoy doing. Because to me, driving is enjoying. I enjoy driving. I love driving. And usually a lot of drivers, they, they, they drive a lot of hours. It depends how many hours you drive a day. <coughs> That's how you feel. You know, if you love to drive, but you know, a good 10 hours, it's, it's, it's not bad. What about the waiting? You know, when you wait, you get a lot of stress. Waiting is bad, because especially if you want to make a living, you want trying to make some money, when you wait, and you're not making any money. Drivers, they want to move. They want to go back and forth, bringing the, the container from one side to another one. That way they can make some money. But if the harvest takes so long that you, you can be able to take only one container too, at the end of the day, you're very tired. You're stressful. You know somewhere I can park that thing for the night? I got to gotta wait till tomorrow to get that load off. Yeah, it's a place over here by uh, by Anaheim and Santa Fe. Okay. It's a it's a diner and a hotel. Okay. You can park your truck behind. You own what do you, you own operator? Or? I'm owner of right here. They pay you guys by the load or something? They they pay us by by, by the load right now. But how much do they get paid? Uh, I get paid twenty fifty. That's now, good. That's good. But I've been there I've been there thirteen years. So what he's doing is they're hiring people, you know, to make ten eleven dollars an hour with no experience. discover old-fashioned exploitation with a new twist. Force workers to own and maintain their own means of production, paid by the piece, and pretend that they are independent businessmen. There's all kinds of trucking companies. There, sometimes all you need is a fax machine and the ability to speak English, and ta-da, you're a trucking company. Um, that means you can't give your workers anything that uh, true business and a responsible business should be giving their workers. Um, essentially what you're doing is you hire these guys, you contract these guys to run loads and you make money off of them. As oftentimes Latino, the Latino labor force is seen in this country as just a pair of arms and nothing attached to that those pair of arms, which is yeah, part of that labor, they're exploited. They're very vulnerable to that exploitation, specifically because they don't have access to the English language.
what are you guys planning to do? Well, right now we're, we're talking with the union, and the union is trying to organize the drivers because two months ago, three months ago, we have uh, two big accidents in the port, which is not something rare. There's a lot of uh, risks that we take inside the port. One of the onboarding guys grew up one of the containers on top of the truck, and the driver was sadly damaged. of other ports are taken over by middle class tourism and upper class housing. <laughs> but the ports of Southern California are ruled by the sheer volume of cargo. The Walt Disney Company planned but failed to build a harbor front amusement park in the adjoining port of Long Beach. The steamship companies had no issues <coughs> in tourist traffic getting in the way of the trucks carrying containers. So there are still some small havens for immigrant families on Sunday. The opening ceremony had a funereal quality, as if parading the coffins in the war to come. After the attacks of September 11, 2001, the 
president urged Americans to keep shopping, stoking the engine of the debt-driven economy that ships out only one full container for every two that come in. First among containerized exports from the port of Los Angeles is waste paper headed for recycling factories in the developing world. Official unemployment has passed 12%. Independent statisticians argue that the real rate is nearly double now. If California were a country, it would fall easily within the top seven or eight economies in the world. And yet the state itself is going bankrupt. Between the tracks of two competing railroads, another forgotten space a bargain basement, 21st century version of a poor house in a society that specializes in prisons. darker and darker and darker. And my wig is because my hair comes out, you know, mysteriously, my hair comes out. And it wasn't like that at first, but I get over here and I, I take my hair out to wash it and stuff, and it's coming up, you know. 
in passion, and I'm someone that's, that's shaving my hair off. That type of stuff. And I've gotten overweight to where I mean, I'm just starting to handle my weight, and in the hot sun, I can barely walk to, to across to the corner without getting hot. Questions? Comments? You've got so much information it's about this whole thing. How did you find yourself taking on this topic? Oh, that's clear. I've been working on this topic you know, since the mid 80s. Cultural vocabulary, and then obviously, um, which you know, just kind of the process of developing both of those, and then maybe also about the reception of your particular perspective, maybe particularly like in the United States, where there has been such a concentrated um, and and virulent like anti-union, um, big business, uh, uh, basically kind of promotional strategy. I'm sure there must be a diversity in opinions and your, the, your ideas might be received quite differently in the European context where communism has a different legacy and hasn't been attacked in the same way. Yeah, those are kind of some questions. So. Uh, well, the, um, I think when you, when you make a film for a general Let's call it a cinema. It's, it's very unclear what the cinema audience is now, right? And um, the in Europe certainly there are slots in television that um, still support, uh, I would say, fairly experimental forms of, of filmmaking. But those those slots are shrinking. Channel in Holland, and they 
screened the film. Um, and we'll, we'll also show it on R ORF in Austria. Uncut, I mean the, the, the full version. The uh, Dutch version is 75 minutes. Uh, our, our slot got changed on us at a very late point. We thought it was going to be 90. The film is 113 minutes. We thought we were going to 90. I'm, I'm answering you. It may seem like I'm not answering you, but I'm trying to explain how the, the language question sort of follows from, from these constraints, I think. Um, uh, and then the decision was made, for, with which I had no problem, to, to have a Dutch voiceover, you know, a Dutch actor read the, the narration, rather than subtitle. Uh, and in, in fact, in, in the German version, it's gonna be Nina Hagen, who's doing the reading, uh, which I, I think she should sing it. Um, um, so we'll see what happens with that. That's still still being done. Um, the uh, so you have all these different circuits, and obviously in the U.S. it's more there's it's somewhat more restricted. You have you know the POB on, on public television and this kind of thing at the Sundance Channel. And as I said, the film was rejected by Sundance. So, you know, we're waiting to see about Tribeca. possible here. But I, I, I think the, I don't see a big difference between the, the writing or the problem of writing and the sort of writing I do in other contexts. I don't, um, though I, I do think that writing for film narration is a, a very special problem and it, it involves, um, I've always appealed to the American poet Charles Olson's idea of projected verse and seen that as particularly important for writing film narration. He, t he talks about the relation between thinking and breathing and composition and poetry and you know, sort of developing verse. And I, I think when you're writing for the moving image, you, you, the, it's, it's good to heed that, you know, feel that you have breath involved. And that then carries over into the reading of the text, text for the soundtrack. Uh, so, um, I, I don't, I mean, I don't think it's a, I mean, the idea was to avoid uh, it seeming like esoteric knowledge, I suppose, you know, that these are things that we can talk about in public discourse, I suppose that's find a language that is relatively accessible and where the, the political questions, or the economic questions that the film raises are, are expressed as clearly as possible. I think maybe that seems unusual now. I mean, I think Noel, who you know, is a great film theorist and a film historian, um, sees this as also a shrinking, you know, the, the film of ideas. Noel was one of the people who invented the term essay film, if not the person who first used the term. It's real hard to tell who used it first. And he, by essay film, he, he was looking at people like Franju and uh, Jean Vigo, perhaps. Um, films that weren't really documentaries or departed from what might have been a more normative documentary model. Um, I'm not sure I entirely agree with the argument he made there, but, but um, the idea is that it's a film of ideas. It's a film that, that the essay form is a form of, you know, when one reads an essay, one is following thought in process, you know, the becoming of thought. Um, and I think in general that um, nobody writes, People don't really make essay films anymore, and they don't really make uh, essays anymore. That most, for example, art writing is um, citation. You know, that there aren't really ideas in play. You know, or the ideas are quoted, you know, and cited, but um, it's rare to find a, a critic these days who who uh, actually has a position, you know, of, of, of any substantiality. And I, I also feel that the, the tropes of documentary, even though in some ways the documentary is, has had a kind of revival in, in the current period, there are, are fairly restrictive. Um, um, so, for example, even a film like, like uh, Inside Jaw has to, has to become a sort of detective story rather than, you know, it, one could walk away from that film with the assumption that everything was just great with capitalism, as long as as long as the uh, um, uh, 
30s legislation, you know, separating uh, commercial banks from investment banks was in place. And while there's truth to that, there's also the larger question of the cyclical nature of, of capitalism. You know, it's, it's, it's crisis, it's, uh, it's crisis tendencies. You know, the fact that, that it is a boom and bust cycle over the long term. And, and that's something that Inside Job doesn't really want to get into. Now, there are other filmmakers like Adam Curtis with BBC who actually can go in using archival material and, and the vast fund of material that's available to anybody using the BBC archives. And, and he's able to get more seriously into the intellectual history of debates and economics and that kind of thing. But even the sort of choices that one makes, like Ferguson in Inside Job chooses Matt Damon as a as the, as the voice, because Matt Damon also fictionally represents a kind of intelligent, you know, in films like Green Cell, he represents the, the sort of popular detective. And all these tropes come in the way from Michael Moore, who, you know, Moore is the sort of tribune of the people who's addressing, you know, asking power to account for its actions. And the, and the, the, the test of democracy comes down to when they turn away from you, they're proving the secretiveness and non-transparency of their affairs, you know, and that's counted as a sort of triumph for the truth-seeking, you know, left populist antagonist who is the author. So, all that's well and fine, I mean, that's fine, it's great, I mean, I'm glad people see these films, I, you know, I think, you know, Michael Moore is a significant figure, but to make a film where you're really trying to think about the economy, you know, I mean, the end, I think, for example, with Michael Moore, he, he asks the really crucial question to his priest. He says, is capitalism a sin? And that, that really corresponds, that this is in, in Capital, a love story. Um, and that really corresponds to his politics, which are sort of left-wing Roman Catholic. They're not Marxist politics. You know, they're, they're, they're kind of left-wing Catholic politics. Um, and they do have a kind of roots in Christian socialism. And I don't, I don't minimize that. But this, our film is more of a Marxist film. That's our intellectual ground. And so that, um, it's, in that sense, we, didn't, we also didn't want to get into the arcana of terminology and you know, to try to speak fairly clearly about things. I don't know. This is only part of the film. And, 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 and in fact, the story we tell here is a pretty dire one. I, I actually, Noel didn't, uh, he doesn't like the United States, though he was born here. Uh, and he doesn't like coming, especially since September 11th. Uh, so, and he's 80 now, so uh, makes it hard for him. But um, he, uh, so I directed the LA segment, and and when Noel saw the footage, he said, "Boy, you, it's all about depth. You know, it's all about it's." And and that was how, that's how I felt the way into it. You know, is 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 that this this the, the most dire of images in a way. The three homeless people talking. They're they're here. You know, because the fall has been the greatest here. By contrast, our, our segments in China seem rather optimistic. You know, you, know, you have young people. The Dutch seem like they're all on drugs. <laughs> the Americans are just totally depressed. Uh, and the Chinese are sort of, you know, despite their, their, their privation they engage in, they're, they're, they're kind of optimistic. So we, there's a different tone. And in Bilbao, it's, it's more like, you know, about something else. It's a weird detour toward the end of the film where we, we ask, well, what is the ideological work that goes with this neoliberal free trade ideology? Of, you know, the more stuff in motion, the more that's made, the better. And, the, and, and I'm always offering Frank Gehry up as my bad example. Um, you know, of a, of a kind of, what I see is the ideological complement to neoliberal, neoliberalism. You know, it's all surface, it's all, it's kind of aesthetic triumphalism that supposedly cures a benighted place. And it's bullshit because in Bilbao, in fact, it's still an industrial city. They're still building ships. It's just they have a myth that the museum rescued them, you know, and it's a convenient myth for the, for the vast bourgeoisie to promote. But, um, so the maritime, the way the maritime motifs come back are both elided, or, or obscured and turned to decoration by Gary is something that really interests me as a sort of complex semiotic operation. But, you know, that's, yeah, sorry. So, um, 
If, uh, I'm, I'm curious what you would think, uh, how you would uh, imagine the relationship between neoliberalism in economics and cosmopolitanism, the idea of cosmopolitanism as a, a cultural, I, I think it's fair to say cultural virtue, <coughs> right? Um, in that they're uh, both, uh, you know, globalist in nature and, um, yeah, well, how, how do you see the relationship? Do, are they antagonistic, or does one, one, it would seem as though they, they might, um, you know, amplify one another, mm -hmm. they might, there might be a, a, a co-presenter. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, the, uh, <clears throat> the, actually, it's interesting that you, you raise the issue of cosmopolitanism, because the, um, the, uh, the very end of the film raises the issue a bit surprisingly, because it's not, it's only, it's only there in a very implicit way until the end uh, of, of, of universal hospitality. So, so the, the film ends on a note of, of Kantian ethics. Um, and, and to explain that, it, it might take a second. Basically, you begin the film and you see this, you see a shot of, of the Shelba. You don't know it's the Shelba, you know, the river outside of Antwerp. And, um, and, and the voiceover says, this is a forgotten space. You know, it's in between, where is it? You know, there's cargo. And then it goes into this village below the dike wall. It says, in the narration says, the dike protects the village from the sea, but what protects the village from the sea economy? And then you're very quickly out of there. That's a drop. You know, the village looks deserted. It looks a little decrepit. You don't know what's going on. And then only at the end of the film, after Bilbao, we come back to the village, and you discover that this village has been uh, under the hammer for, because the Antwerp and, and uh, uh, Flemish, you know, Flanders, Port development people want to, want to demolish it. It's a 16th century, 17th century village where Rubens lived and so on. They want to wipe it out to expand a container terminal. Right? And the people there have been fighting, there have been squats, there have been occupations, there have been police, you know, military police actions, and so on. So here's a locality defending itself against this neoliberal globalizing force. But there's a twist at the end, and this came. It's strange how this came as a problem for us because one of our key guys that we talked to there was a, a, a man who, um, uh, a local, he called himself an historian and he wrote a book about the fight in this town, similar to the fight of these people against the rail line in Holland, uh, just to the north. And, uh, and we discovered that he was a fascist. So he spoke very, very strongly against this kind of neoliberal corporate thing. But his, as a young guy, he, he, he uh, published a website called the Freebooter, the Breibiker. And, um, and so his opposition to globalism was, was from this sort of right-wing nationalist perspective, you know, that this is, this is gonna damage Flemish culture and tradition, and very anti-cosmopolitan in a way, but from that right-wing, you know, that, that whole herder, if, if we follow Zeeb Sternheil's history of the Enlightenment, and, and the anti-enlightenment, it's the Herder line rather than the Rousseau line. You know? uh -huh. So, uh, you know, nation, nation soul, nice blood. Nation. Yeah, yeah. And so the question that's posed at the end of the film is, here's, you know, here's a question to the beleaguered people of Duel, this village, which has the unlikely name Target for gold, you know? um, which tended to contribute to a lot of the graphics that artists did about the town being slated for demolition. Um, uh, we say, I say, well, what, what, what hospitality would, would, would this town offer? Were, it, were the town able to survive if a ship were to sink in the channel? What hospitality to the refugees from the global south who flee the rising tides? So that's, that's where this question of a more co you know, cosmopolitan um, ethic comes into play. Um, but I, I do think it's a question of co kind of cosmopolitanism from below. And that's the thing that interests me about the the whole world of seafaring is that there has there have been elements of that. And, you know, we have these historians of 18th century seafaring like Marcus Redeker and Peter Leinebach who've shown how abolitionism would never have happened without the actions of freed slaves and seafarers, you know, communicating between all the, the metropoles and peripheral spaces around the Atlantic and creating this, this discourse against slavery. So that model of cosmopolitanism, I think, is one we have to counterpose to the the model that it's the elites who guide, guide this. And um, 
in the film you see this sort of wooden shoe being carved and then some girls dancing to, to Irish music. I mean, it's a sort of bizarre melange of stuff going on, but it's, it's really an attempt to pose this question of the, um, an ethic of, 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 let's say, democratic cosmopolitanism from below against the, this corporate model. Does that help? Yeah. Yeah, I was just um, your work. Uh, for one, the the video that you showed is really powerful and it is really amazing. I, I I liked it a lot and I'm looking forward to seeing it at some point. Um, your work with the Global Mariner is that what what it was? Yeah. It, it reminded me of um, this article that was written by a man named um, Hugh Lo. Uh, Lou Yodel, who wrote um, who wrote a DIY zine for about ten years called Seedhead, and which was sort of like how to make a wood lathe in New Mexico, and then he dropped all of that stuff and built his own boat and ended up sailing around the world with this um, DIY boat, and then came back and while he was sailing, he wrote this long zine about um, kind of about the difference between folk science and capitalist science and. He has um, this thesis that, like back in the day, scientists would get on their boat and like sail, and it's kind of like you either sink or swim as, in terms of like navigation. So it's like you have a scientist that is like getting on the boat and is like putting a dead dog on some mast, and is that going to work, like to navigate versus like a compass? And so I'm kind of thinking about like the term like that in terms of like making public art and like. Um, Kind of like putting yourself on the boat and like you're you're like you're doing this like seriously and like you're you're you yourself are on the line and so in terms of like your work with like solidarity and your work with um, with all of these um, working class people like how do you navigate that for yourself like that responsibility versus like making public art I hope that's not too convoluted. It's a, well, it's a little hard to answer, um, I, I, because you, you raise a number of questions, issues that sort of aren't in your final question, but um, well, I, I think ideally the audience, I mean, one, we, we can't, you know, we can try to pick our audience, but we don't, we don't control it, you know, and so um, I, I don't want to sound like Donald Rumsfeld saying you go to war with the art world you have, you know, but that's, you know, you know what I mean. We, we sort of, there are certain given audiences, and to say that you're not speaking to those people, it seems to me, is foolish, because that audience is probably going to show up no matter what you do, you know. I mean, and, the, and, and it would take a whole great deal of work to so thoroughly alienate that audience that they wouldn't show up anymore. Um, I mean, you could move to, so, so one question for me is moving to this other zone, the world of movie making and such. Um, but, but that has its own problems and its own, you know, its own strictures. Um, Can I go back to what I was going to Yeah, do you want to follow me? Ask you, um, yeah, just with this film, you're six months into it, starting to show it, and I'm just wondering, you talked about the sort of specific limitations of student media and student yeah. film, playing the broadcast. Right. What are your sort of thoughts about you know, speculating on how the film is going to get an audience and slowly by accumulating yeah. these different kinds of viewing situations in six months and how are you thinking about that? It's a little hard to say at this point. I mean, we, we, we have a potential sales engine, but he's only interested in selling it to television. So that then restricts what might be done. And, and we're not. You know, for, for these distributors, there's not a lot of money in, in uh, theater anymore, in, in theatrical screenings. And uh, so you start, you go to the festivals, you try to get the film out. Um, I have a feeling this film is going to have a strange career. I know, I know Jonathan Rosenbaum wants to show it in Chicago next, in April, in, in advance of any American US screenings, because he, he picked it as one of the three 
best films of 2010 without distribution, along with uh, Godard's uh, film Sociedis and, and uh, another film. Uh, and, and I'm thinking, well, that would be interesting if he shows it to film critics. But he can't write about it in an American journal until he wants to, until it has a real American screening day. And the kids in the Whitney program, your, your sort of colleagues in terms of, you know, want to show it in conjunction with a show they're doing uh, called, called Closure. Um, and the idea is to have David Harvey as a commenter come. So the, the, the Reina Sofia in Madrid is, has scheduled a screening, and, you know, the Stavik Museum is doing one. So there's this kind of weird art people that know me or know what I do, they want to bring it in. And, and, and I think there's probably a future for it in DVD because things get around that way, but that takes, you have to get to a certain state before you actually go to that and do that. What about the possibility of public television in the US, either you know, local or nationally broadcast? Um, is that being invested? Well, that's part, we had interest as we were making the film, but I haven't heard much since we finished it, so we'll see. You know? mm -hmm. And I think that's gonna take some American um, festival venues for that. I just don't know. I mean, I look, uh, the, um, um, <coughs> yeah, yeah, the strange things like the documentary channel on cable, but, you know, it's you know, a mixed bag that you see there. But I have a feeling, you know, Jonathan Rosenbaum has written this, has this new book, you know, Cinema and Cinephilia, or Goodbye Cinema, Low Cinephilia, or whatever. Where he's, I'm, I'm getting the title wrong. I just started reading it, and, and he, you know, really, the, the situation we're in is that, is that on the one hand, that what what was known as cinema, you know, the, the cinema based in the theater and the projection room and all of that, that's declining. But people are trading DVDs and downloading, and 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 um, so, you know, even filmmakers that are extremely inaccessible because of the rarity of their screenings or people sitting on their work like Straub and Lee. Their work is now, you know, you can download it here or there, or you can find it if you know the right site. And people are looking at these things and seeing them. So film culture is being kept alive for a new generation of people. Um, and I mean, I could say a few things about, maybe, maybe this should happen later, about the art world's relation to cinema. You know, because I think that's pertinent. But, um, I think we have to wrap yeah, yeah. up. Yeah. Thank you very much, Alan. Thank you. Thank you.